Hello, everybody, and welcome to the TeacherCast Educational Network. My name is Jeff Bradbury. Thank you so much for joining us today and making TeacherCast your home for professional development. This is Ask the Tech Coach, episode number 55. Today, we're going to be wrapping up the ISTE conference from two weeks ago and talking about all the great stuff that we did. And we're going to be talking to one of the amazing vendors who was there and what he thought about ISTE. And then a little bit later on the show, we're going to be talking about one of the topics that is going to be maybe on your mind this year as you start to work with your teachers, that topic being flipping your classroom. We're going to learn what does flipping the classroom mean in 2019? Is it any different than it was eight years ago when we started flipping our classroom? I am looking forward to that conversation today. Of course, before we get started, I want to say one more time, Thank you. Thank you so much for making ISTE so special to us. I had so many of you guys come up to me at the conference in Philadelphia and say that you were listening to the show, saying that you guys were you know, having a good time learning from the show. We want to know that you guys are out there. Of course, you can always reach out to us on Twitter at AskTheTechCoach. And I am excited to share that you guys can finally go to AskTheTechCoach.com and see the brand new adventure. We are basically creating Tech Coach World little bit by little bit this summertime and we are designing it so you guys have a one-stop shop for all things tech coaching we just launched it over the last couple days brand new totally brand new experience and over the next week or so we're going to be getting ready to launch the brand new tech coach mastermind and and get our next cohort started so go over to askthetechcoach.com and check out our brand new website let us know what you guys think you can again find us over on twitter at ask the tech coach and you know what let us know what you guys think. Let us know what kind of topics that you guys are looking for. I had a great time at ISTE talking to you guys and getting some ideas for some topics. We are certainly going to be doing all of those topics as we go through. So we would love to know what you guys are doing and let us know what you guys think of this show. My guest today is the CEO of a great company called Uterang. I had a chance to check out what they were doing at ISTE this year, and I want to bring on Mr. Adam Bevan. Adam, how are you today? Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, doing great. Thank you. It is so nice to have you on. You said that you were having a great time also at ISTE. What did you think of the conference? Uh, Well, it was very different to the British uh, EdTech conferences I've attended in the past. And uh, I was in the startup pavilion this year. I had an amazing time, great energy and some really interesting startups this year and just some great things going on there, I thought. Now, now, you were there at the Startup Pavilion, which was basically, it was like a square that was like 100 feet by like 100 feet. And there were so many great new companies and companies I'm sure that you guys are going to be able to see over the next couple months to years being used in your classroom. I got to ask you, from somebody who was in the vendor role at the conference, what were you seeing that was exciting to you? Because you, you, know, you had like 50 people all around you from all these different great companies, and then you had teachers coming up. What did you think about the conference, and what were teachers excited about when you were speaking to them? I think uh, some of the big things that I noticed is just the advances that are happening in artificial intelligence in the EdTech space. Mm. So the booth opposite uh, mine, or the pod, was, uh, was focused on uh, AI in terms of understanding uh, the vocals of students and actually understanding the emotions of students and being able to see how well students are understanding, comprehending what they're learning. So that's really, really exciting. Um, we also had a lot of really interesting things going on in the virtual reality space, which is where I specialize. Um, there's a new engine that's come out called Unreal Engine 4, and that's been used really, really well, particularly for science. Obviously, a big uh, new bit of hardware that came out is the Oculus Quest. And that is a game changer, in my opinion. In the next couple of years, that's going to be something we see more and more in the classroom. And just some of the ways that these startups were using that was really, really interesting. You know, I I, I want to just echo what you said there. I noticed that, you know, almost every row, which got there, there must have been 25 rows of just, just vendors and vendors. The whole idea of augmented virtual reality, all of those, you know, extra sensory kind of things. I don't even know if that's the right term here, but. It was just amazing to see the technology. It's cut, It's getting smaller. It's getting cheaper. It's getting to be able to be used by students of, of not just the older grades, but the younger grades. And and you know something a little bit about this. Tell us a little bit about your website, utering.com. So my company, utering.com, what we're doing is we're basically taking virtual reality but we're taking it in a different direction to a lot of the industry. So most of the industry is focused on CGI, 
so generating graphics using computers. Whereas what we're doing is we're uh, partnering with um, videographers who've shot for huge companies, Discovery Channel, um, Nat Geo, people like that. We're actually traveling around the world and finding these amazing um, immersive experiences. And then we're, we're putting those into the VR headsets for students so that, so that they can experience other parts of the world that they wouldn't otherwise see. Um, and then the kind of cool thing that we're doing additionally in the industry, other than focusing on real life events rather than computer generated things, is we provide real time analytics. And I think that will tie in really nicely when we talk about the flipped um, classroom and how it's evolved over the last eight years. I'm really interested to speak with you more about some of the things that have changed there. Now, you had... You had mentioned that through through utering.com, which is y o u t o r i n g dot com, um, students were able to go and see places that they might not have been able to see before. Um, what are some examples of some of the places that students are able to check out? One of my favorite ones, and I took this to ISTE, um, was uh, virtual reality experience of Antarctica. So, for example, I went there. It took me four days, I think, over wow. the rough seas. Uh, it's called Drake Passage. It was incredibly rough seas to get to the continent, the, the last continent, as they call it, and uh, just some amazing kind of um, footage of, you know, the, the, the biology there, so the penguins, the seals, things like that, but also just these enormous sweeping landscapes that are almost alien. It, they don't even look like they belong on this planet. And uh, it was just great to, to bring that to people at ISTE, for example, and to show them that. And, uh, you know, it turns out people really love penguins. And how does a, a school district or a teacher get connected with you? Is this a system that they purchase uh, a series of hardware or applications? How, how does the whole thing work? So basically, I can lease out the Oculus Go headsets. That's the recommended headset. Or any other Android headset would work as well with our system. We basically provide a platform that loads onto the virtual reality headset uh, it also, we have a subscription model, which means that you can, um, you can log on to your, your browser as you would with a lot of other educational services, and you can actually build your own curricula based on the virtual reality um, experiences that we're creating. So that was something that people were really excited about at ISTE. They loved the idea of uh, getting this amazing footage that we had shot, but then using it in their own way, you know, uh, looking at that through their own lens for their own students, building out math programs, English programs, sociology programs, all different programs. Even uh, special ed programs was a big thing as well that came up a lot with some of the OTs that spoke with me. So it's, all, it's an all-encompassing system. Uh, you subscribe to it, and once you're subscribed, you can build out your own curricula using our very easy-to-use system. I love what you guys are doing because it gives teachers the ability not only to create those one-to-one -one lessons, but also the ability to create a curriculum that reaches everybody at the same time. And that's what we're going to be talking about today when it comes to our flipped classroom. Now, we at TeacherCast are coming up on our eight-year anniversary. And I remember very, very distinctly one of the first few podcasts that we did was with a, a, a tech director, and, and we were talking about the flipped classroom. And he, at the time, defined flipped classroom as this teacher creates video student goes home watches video student comes back to school the next day a complete expert and know-it-all and now you can move on <laughs> i'm convinced that that just doesn't work um what are your thoughts what does the flipped classroom look like today in 2019 now technology is different hardware is different classroom philosophy is different when you think of flipped classroom how do you define that I think that definition is probably a little bit idealistic. Um, you know, in an ideal world, maybe that would be the case. But the, the truth is um, how the flipped classroom has moved on, in my opinion, is that it provides students with the educational tools that they need to learn some of the core concepts in some of their, um, in their subjects. So obviously, I was a high school English teacher. Is, it was my background before I got into ed tech. So I'll use an analogy using English for this. So I... It's a tremendous drain on teachers' time to have to um, educate every single cohort of their students about, for example, what uh, a metaphor is. Let's take that. It might take 20, even 30 minutes to really make sure that your class of 20 to 30 students understands that concept in your classroom time. 
Um, what I think has moved on with Flip Classroom to make it better is when you get companies such as my own, and there are others out there doing similar things, that provide analytics on the Flip Classroom model. So the students are given these core concepts, let's keep the idea of metaphors, but they're actually asked questions and they have to answer those uh, along the, the uh, education program to make sure then that the teacher can just double check that the students have really understood what a metaphor is, rather than just giving them you know, a web page to look at which tells them what a metaphor is. They're not, they don't have any opportunities to answer any questions and the teacher just assumes they've understood it without really checking, checking on that progress. So I think it's that, those analytics that have really helped Flip Classroom get better. And um, as I said, companies like mine were providing real-time analytics even on those things. So not only can you check that they've done the homework, but you can actually see, let's say there are 10 questions that are asked through that, that module on learning metaphors, you can double check that they've really understood that concept. On just one simple screen, you can see all 30 of your students and you can see which questions they've answered correctly, which questions they've answered incorrectly. And that can then inform your classroom because you can say, okay, well, the majority of the students seem to understand the, uh, the basic concept of metaphors, but maybe they don't really understand the nuance of why we use metaphors or um, the effects that a metaphor might have on a, uh, on, a, on, a, on a paragraph in a text or something like that. So, so then it saves the teacher a lot of time once you have the analytics and the data behind it to prove that your students are actually benefiting from these flipped classroom uh, lessons that are being set. Uh, you know, I think that, that really wasn't in the, the definition that was given before. Oh, I, I, I completely uh, agree with you. And, you know, obviously eight years ago, you know, everything about technology was completely different and not even, you know, not even invented yet. Um, you know, we have many tech coaches that are listening to this show and they're always trying to figure out how do they support their teachers? And it's one thing to have great technology, great applications that have these things. It's another thing to be able to bring that technology a into the school district, but B find the time and the ways to support and, and, and give the professional development to our teachers, either one-to-one -one or in mass. When we're looking at things like, you know, the virtual realities, the flipped classrooms, you know, creating videos, creating some kind of a learning platform, what can we as tech coaches do to make it easy on us to then provide great professional development so that way our teachers are implementing flipped classrooms of whatever the kind to our students? How do we best support our teachers? I think one of the things that tech coaches can do is be very selective about the companies they work with in terms of the, the, the UX, the user experience. Mm -hmm. I think that if, you, if tech coaches were to invest potentially just another uh, you know, few days really researching what, which uh, different options are out there and which one has the best user experience, user design, then in terms of the amount of time that you have to give teachers to get them to understand how the concept works and the professional development, it goes down massively. Because you know, one thing that traditionally I find a lot of ed tech companies haven't been quite so good at, in my own experience as a teacher for, for certain, is actually allowing the teacher to have a nice intuitive design like you might get on, a, on an iPhone or an Android phone. They just work. You just you pick it up and you know how to use it pretty much. Right. But a lot of the, a lot of the ed tech companies that are the bringing out different um, GUIs, graphical user interfaces, things like that, they, they aren't making them intuitively so that teachers can just load a screen and they can see uh, exactly how it works. And it, it doesn't take a huge amount of training to get there. So I think that's a huge thing is the UX, the, the, the user experience. You know, uh, I I have this philosophy with flipped classrooms and basically when a teacher sets something up for the students to learn on their own, my philosophy kind of says, yes, you're, you're setting it up for the students, but at home, you're also setting it up so that way the parents can sit there and work with things. So, you know, maybe in the case of a video, you're set, you know, maybe, maybe you create a basic screencast for, you know, what is a metaphor, how to do basic math functions like that. And I, I know that student may or may not listen to it or look at it. But I'm also knowing that I can create those videos so that way mom and dad can sit down next to the kid, do a quick 30-second video, and then spend the next 20 minutes helping the child with their homework. 
and I always try to look at it from, okay, how many different ways can I use this video to reach my target, which is either the kid or the student or, or whomever, so that way there is that fighting chance, so that way when the kid comes back the next day or over the weekend, they know a little bit more than when they left my class. Absolutely. Well, I, obviously, my point about user experience and user design helps with the parents as well, because many school districts, many schools don't have that many contact moments with the parents other mm -hmm. than, you know, parent teacher evenings, things like that. So, again, having this experience that a parent can just pick it up and they can support is a big thing. Um, in terms of you, you mentioned about whether the students done the homework or not. Well, obviously, if you've got a good, um, a good piece of software that actually tracks the analytics of whether the student has completed the homework or not, you can quite easily see actually whether they did or didn't do it. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is, what's worth mentioning is, again, on the other side of it, when we're talking about building out these curricula, because it would be easy for a company like mine to create a suite of uh, core concepts for English, math, STEM subjects, let's say. But the truth is, whilst we could do that, and perhaps as we develop, we will do that, we'd rather have something so simple that a teacher could drag and drop questions onto a video format on our platform so easily it would be as easy as building out a PowerPoint to do the same job. So basically usurping that older tech that people are already familiar with. I, I mean, I may be incorrect about this, but I don't think that a huge amount of time and effort probably in many districts was spent actually getting teachers to understand PowerPoint, the, the user experience was so good with it that it, it was just easy. You just sat there and you, you just worked it out quite mm -hmm. quickly. And it should be the same with this next generation is my opinion on it. And I think it is definitely the tech coach's uh, job to make sure that whatever is being implemented in their schools and districts is something that does have a good design so that it is actually usable rather than spending huge budgets on things that are barely being used and that the teachers resent. Well, let me pick up on something that you just said. You, you said good design, but then you said usable, right? And we as tech coaches often have the scenario where a teacher comes up and says, I want to try this. And they're so excited. But you as the tech coach kind of have to sit and go, is that really what you want to do? Is that really the right way? Maybe I can steer you over here. So I want to put you on the spot here. What makes a good lesson to flip? Can all lessons be flipped or are there some that work better than others? And maybe if we go, you know, if you want to stick with the metaphor idea that that's, that's fine. Um, but, but what, what makes a good, and I'm going to ask you again, what makes a bad, but what, what makes a good a lesson that's a candidate for, you know, what, maybe we can try something where the kids have that opportunity to work both one-on-one -on -one and with here, with you here as a group. Okay, great. So, you know, thinking practically, generally speaking, you want to set homework assignments that are around, 30 minutes, give or take. You can do a little bit more than that, a bit less than that, but that's around the target, right, for most, most homework assignments. So there definitely are terrible uh, uses for flipped classroom. An example I'll give you, before I headed out to ISTE, I was in New York for a few days, so I was shooting uh, some VR experiences there, um, Grand Central Station, Brooklyn Bridge, things like that. Everything that I was recording for that would have been absolutely useless for flipped classroom because what we were doing with that footage is we were trying to calculate things, for math, for example, we were trying to calculate the footfall across a video and then use algebra and algorithms to work out how profitable the businesses in the area might be. So it's quite complex, abstract thinking. That would not work in a flipped classroom. In my opinion, the whole point of using a flipped classroom is smaller units of, of study, core concepts, things that are very easy to actually follow, so, you know, you could teach in terms of math, you can teach obviously addition, subtraction, multiplication, those simpler skills, same with English, building up literacy, building up numeracy, anything that is almost self-contained um, as a concept is a good candidate for a flipped learning module. The whole point as well, I think, as educators of the flipped classroom method is then the students come into the classroom with that base level of knowledge the lower order skills on Bloom's taxonomy. And then the whole joy of that for teachers is then they get their hour to push that knowledge and to go into those higher level thinking skills. So my answer really is anything that is a, a smaller, more manageable chunk of information that effectively you as a teacher have probably delivered about 
a thousand times <laughs> to a thousand different cohorts of students. That is definitely something that the flipped classroom can absorb for you and can just emancipate you from having to give that same 20, 30 minute spiel again. Anything that's getting into the higher order thinking skills where you're uh, synthesizing new ideas, um, analyzing things in a bit more depth or evaluating things, that is not, in my opinion, something that we should be doing in a flipped classroom. Well, one of the things I noticed about ISTE was that there was a lot of new technologies that were coming out, which were in the digital portfolio range or the website, you know, a, a curation tools. What suggestions do you have for applications or, or, you know, digital hubs, really, where teachers can throw a bunch of stuff on there and use it as that teacher website, that curricular website? Um, we talk a lot here about Google Sites. I, you know, you can you can build a nice quick website, throw a bunch of stuff on there, whether it be video, audio, lessons, Google Docs, whatever. Um, on the other side, we know that Teams is great, OneNote is great, all those different things that you can do on the Microsoft side. What what did you see at ISTE, or, or what are some of the things that you might recommend for teachers out there for curation tools or places that you can just put, you know, all of our flipped lessons and then provide that to our students. So I feel like if you're trying to create that all encompassing um, feeling, it really depends on the medium that you're going for. Mm -hmm. So if, if you want your students to be able to access um, web, web uh, pages, things like that, then actually Google sites and some of the other um, curation sites you mentioned will be brilliant. Uh, coming back to your thought about what it is that tech coaches should be looking for when they're thinking about investing in new companies, well, this, this, should be another, um, this should be another kind of consideration if you're going to move into more of my, my world, the VR, AR space. And in honesty, it's a different beast. It's, it's not really something that you can easily orchestrate from a laptop or from a PC once you get into that world. Especially virtual reality, you really need it to be within the headset. So in that sense, really, um, all you're looking for is something where there's a, an easy menu structure within the virtual reality headset, and it's nice and intuitive. So you can easily set the modules, and you can just tell your class, this is the module you should be looking at for flipped classroom for homework. And it's really as simple as point and click at that point. Um, you don't need anything more complex than that, in my opinion, for, for the curation. It can all be built into um the platform that you choose as as a tech coach having said that i'm not aware of any third party that's doing that curation in virtual reality no i mean there i don't think that's something that exists at the moment and uh and that could be some a, a very interesting thing that someone could develop maybe maybe i should be looking into this <laughs> A bit more with you, Tarin. Well, let, 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 let's take a look at this for a second here, because I, I know with everything that you guys are doing with you, Turin, is is in that virtual world, and that requires dollars and, and, and budget and stuff. Um, whether it be you, Turin, or another VR, AR system, anything like that, um, what are what are districts looking at? at you know, is this stuff that we can get into our classrooms in the in the hundreds and the thousands? You, you had mentioned the word earlier, renting. Like, how do we help our teach our, our teachers move into that twenty first and twenty second century um, lesson design with these different uh, augmented virtual platforms? Is this you know, I, I've heard it so many times. I don't want to buy something; it's just going to stay there in the corner. Mm -hmm. How can we bring this stuff in and then actually use it to our advantage? So the best option that um, I believe in is, as, as you rightly said, uh, I offer a leasing service. So you can actually lease the headsets from Utering as part of the service and we'll maintain and make sure that those are repaired. The problem with virtual reality and certain augmented reality, you're quite right, is it's just a, an enormous upfront cost. So $200 a, a headset is just not feasible for a lot of schools and districts. Whereas if you're subscribing and it's costing you around thirty dollars a month, including some of the um, including some of the material, that suddenly becomes a lot more attractive proposition. So I think that's a big thing: is moving into that subscription-based model. It's a lot more affordable. Some school districts and, and schools I've been working with, um, they actually reach out to the parents and they ask, "Is this something you'd like to see more of?" And then the parents quite often, especially now that VR is becoming more mainstream. 
they're willing to actually support that and, and offer to pay a certain amount of that cost, knowing that their child is also going to be able to bring that VR tool home, uh, do homework on it. There's other educational experience, and it's it's a cool bit of a cool bit of kit. Um, the other, the big thing right now is uh, the other question you asked is about how mainstream this is right now. And I, I think it's growing in popularity. The, the areas that we're looking at at the moment, we're filling uh, several niches that we feel need to be addressed. So, for example, special ed programs are, are fantastic in virtual reality. Um, English language learner programs are brilliant as well um, because you can really help support those students in a, in a really meaningful way. And those are practical skills that they need to develop. In terms of day-to-day, -day, I feel like thematic learning is the future. We're going into a world where, well, we're in a world, sorry, right now where 65% of elementary school students enrolled today will be graduating into jobs that don't exist currently. Hmm. And discrete learning model that we've been working with so far, where you do an hour of math, an hour of English, hour of chemistry, whatever, I don't think that's necessarily going to cut it when we're going to have two thirds of the population doing jobs that we don't that don't even exist right now, um, and so what we really need to do is start to build people who think laterally across subjects. And my belief is that thematic learning is the best answer to that. And that, in my opinion, is how virtual reality becomes mainstream, because instead of teaching in this discrete, compartmentalized way, as we have for hundreds of years with mixed success, we now say, okay, here's an amazing set of resources on the theme of travel. We're gonna send you around the world over the next 12 to 15 weeks, and you get the kids excited to learn about that theme or that topic. And then they don't really care whether they're learning math based on that topic or English based on that topic or sociology on that topic. They're just stoked to be learning in general. And they can start to think more laterally. They can start to think about how to solve a problem in a chemistry lesson, maybe with something that they learned in a history lesson or an English lesson. And, uh, and, and to me, that's very, very mainstream. It's very popular. The feedback I got from ISTE was amazing. And I was certainly not the only company doing this, but I think teachers are getting to the stage where they realize this, there needs to be a big push in this direction. Parents want it. They, a lot of them want it. And as tech coaches, the challenge, as you say, is finding the, the best possible companies and platforms that will bring that in with the least amount of disturbance to the, to the classroom time. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And, you know, if you guys are out there and are interested in learning more about these different topics or would like to come on and discuss things like flipped learning, virtual learning, we are here for you guys. And we would love to have you guys be a guest any week this summer. We've got some great things happening and we would certainly love to include you guys here. Talking today with Adam Bevan, the CEO of Uturing, Y-O-U-T-O-R-I-N-G dot com. And Adam, as we go through this year, you know, we're, we've wrapped up ISTE. We're looking forward to the 2019 2020 school year wow my goodness um you know i want to ask you this question because i've asked it from everybody that i ran into at isti when we see each other in anaheim at isti 2020 what are you excited about where do you see this technology where do you see flipped classroom what do you think the next 12 months is going to be for everybody so the, the huge push forward, at least in terms of VR, AR, is going to be actually getting um, students to be able to act, interact more and more uh, in more and more sophisticated ways with the immersive environments that are mm. being put into those headsets. That's the huge push. So at the moment, there's, you know, there's limited interactivity with that environment. There's not that much going on in that world. Um, some are point and click. Others maybe have some limited interaction if they, you know, reach out and touch a certain thing, it might react in a limited way. But the graphics and the physics around all of that is going to develop so fast. I mentioned earlier the Oculus Quest. That's a really exciting bit of kit because that's a standalone headset, so you don't need it wired into an expensive PC or anything. And it gives you what's called six degrees of freedom as well. So it really tracks where your movements are in real time. Um, it's basically going to become the matrix mm. over the next sort of five years. I, when I see you in Anaheim next year, will it be quite there? No, 
But that is the bit that I'm most excited about. I'm most excited about the fact that there are these ed tech companies like Uterine and many others that are literally building a second reality, uh, an incredible educational platform, but also bringing in, I think the other thing I'm really excited to see develop is just what we can do with the data around this. The real-time analytics that, that can be created from this are, are something that we've never experienced before. And um, one, of the, one of the big things that touches my heart is, is actually, obviously, the, the amount of um, depression, anxiety, and things like that that teenagers are experiencing these days. And as I said, there was a pod next to mine. Using AI, they're starting to be able to recognize the emotional state of students hmm. based on the tone of voice, the pitch, the speed, things like that. So to me, that's going to be a huge tool in helping to combat, to, to identify these students that are having potentially issues that haven't been noticed by the schools. Uh, and it's not the school's fault, but being able to, to track that and add value and really help with those mental health issues and things like that as well, that's going to be huge, I think. Well, I, I think it's for certain that things have come a long way in the last eight years, and they're certainly going to come a longer way in the next 12 months. And I am certainly looking forward to seeing what you guys out there are doing. Once again, if you guys have any questions about this topic, we would love to hear from you guys. You can reach out to us on Twitter at Ask the Tech Coach. And of course, you can go over to teachercast.net slash subscribe and Please share that link with your friends. We would love to have them on the show, have you guys on the show, and we would love to be able to share all the great things about instructional technology coaching this year and beyond on Ask the Tech Coach. Adam, one more time, where can we learn about the great things that you guys are doing over at utering.com? So our website, utering.com, is a brilliant hub with some of the most relevant information, but also feel free to reach out to me personally at this stage. I'd love to partner with people. Uh, my email is adam at utering.com. Um, I would love to have more discussions about this with people who are interested. Uh, one of the best things about ISTE actually was uh, having uh, uh, some time in the playground, Playground A. I don't know if you managed to check that out. But I had so many um, teachers coming up to me. They had received grants for 20, 30 Oculus Go or things like that. And they just said, right, what do I do with this now? <laughs> and I, I, love answering, I love answering those questions. So so uh, I'm absolutely here to talk about it and passionate about it. So utering.com or my, my email address, adam at utering.com. I'm happy to talk to people about it. And of course, we're going to have all the links over on our show notes. This is Ask the Tech Coach podcast, episode number 55, talking today about how we can support our teachers in that flipped classroom environment through things like AR and VR. And of course, check out all the great stuff over at utering.com. It is a great platform, great system. And I want to one more time say thank you to Adam for being on the show. And thank you to really everybody over there at that startup pavilion. It was a great time and great, you know, great opportunity to meet everybody at ISTE. And I hope you guys out there who are at ISTE he had a good time as well next week we're going to have another great topic i believe nick will be back with us uh, he's coming back on um, after a successful move uh, just a little bit north and we're going to be talking about some of the great things that we're going to be doing here not only throughout the summertime but we're going to be launching that brand new mastermind class and we're going to be getting our cohort back together if you'd like to learn more or would like to be a part of our tech coach mastermind and it's going to be awesome it's going to be epic this year guys Head on over to teachercast.net slash mastermind. That's teachercast.net slash mastermind. Right now, if you're listening to this, you can sign up to be on the waiting list. And we're going to have all the details coming out soon. We're going to be getting started in September. We want to have you guys there. If you are an instructional technology coach in a district, we would love to have you guys join. And as we say uh, for everything with the mastermind, if you're going to invest in one thing this year, guys, Take a moment and invest in yourself. We, we're certainly happy to work with you guys and work with an entire district of tech coaches. Head on over to teachercast.mastermind today. And of course, that wraps up this week's episode of Ask the Tech Coach. One last time, thank you to Adam and thank you to all you guys for making TeacherCast your home for professional development. And on behalf of everybody here in the network, my name is Jeff Bradbury. Keep up the great work in your classrooms and continue sharing your passions with your students.